Okay, uh, we're going to uh, continue on here. Chapter 14 still. The end of chapter 14 is near. Um, so last time we talked about a couple of uh, other titration curves. And uh, we talked about titration of a uh, weak acid and a strong base. And again, in this case, uh, we are adding the base uh, to our acid case and again that gives us a uh, sort of titration curve that looks like our normal sort of titration curve and again as we talked about we have sort of uh, uh, four parts to this titration curve like normal uh, we have before we begin really the titration and add any base in this case uh, remember that at that point, it's really like a Ka type problem as we have basically just a weak acid. Uh, you can use the concentration of the weak acid. Um, nothing's been mixed with it or anything like that. Uh, so you're good to go. Uh, the second part in this type of titration is uh, 20. No, the second part is uh, before the equivalence point. And, and <clears throat> excuse me. Before the equivalence point, we definitely do get a reaction that occurs, obviously, between our, say, base and acid. Uh, but what will happen at this point, because we are before the equivalence point in this type of titration, is uh, we essentially, as we talked about, will hit a buffer situation that's going to occur. And you do need to do, as we talked about, an ice table. Uh, really, the purpose of that ice table is to kind of figure out the concentration of your buffer components. Uh, once you've done that first ice table, you do have two options, as we talked about. Uh, you can um, either go straight into the henderson hasselbach equation, uh, which might be the best option. Or, again, you could do a second ice table instead of the henderson hasselbach uh, equation. Again, it's sort of a common ion-type table uh, that you can do. When we reach the equivalence point in this type of titration, as we talked about, which is sort of the third part here, which is the equivalence point, uh, remember that that's the point where we have the same number of moles of acid and base, uh, which means that all we will have left at this point is a salt that will go through hydrolysis. And that's because that salt does come from a weak acid. Uh, so we expect that part of the salt to go through hydrolysis. And because it comes from a weak acid, that means it will act as a base when it reacts with water and it will accept the H plus from uh, water in that case. And that means pretty much you will always be producing hydroxide there at the equivalence point. And we should usually expect in pretty much all cases, uh, this type of titration to have an equivalence point that's gonna be basic because of that, because you have uh, that salt that's going through hydrolysis at that point. So really, again, as we talked about, it's really like a hydrolysis type problem at that point. Uh, you will need two ice tables that happen at the equivalence point. The first ice table is really just to figure out the concentration of your salt that you're going to have left over. Uh, the second ice table is really just a hydrolysis sort of uh, ice table and problem. And uh, that would be how you get your pH on that one. Uh, past the equivalence point, uh, here you're again just pretty much adding more base than you need. And we really do see a, a switch that occurs here uh, because you pretty much at this point will have an excess amount of base that you're adding from your burette. That pink color from your titration or indicator didn't make you stop your titration. You just kept adding base uh, basically to it here. And the result of that is you will need to do an ice table. And again, the purpose of that ice table is to figure out really the concentration of your strong base that you have left over at that particular point. Uh, once you have the concentration of the strong base, you can then get the POH and then obviously do a little subtraction for 14 and get your pH at that point. So this titration curve that we looked at last time uh, is very different in the sense of how you get the pH uh, than what we saw with the strong acid, strong base. And it is important to understand what type of titration you're looking at. And also uh, it's good to know, as we talked about what, uh, where you are in the titration. Because again, here, if you know where you are in the titration, you should really know what type of calculation you should be doing. And that just makes kind of the calculation part a lot easier uh, rather than trying to figure it out sort of on the fly as you're kind of putting numbers in and stuff like that. The other type of titration we talked about there was a uh, something, a strong acid, I think, and a weak base titration.
And in this setup for this titration, uh, we are actually have the acid up in the burette and we are adding it uh, to our weak base. So because we're really starting with a weak base in this type of titration, uh, our titration curve actually looks uh, opposite. We actually start high and we end low in terms of our titration curve. And we still have the same sort of four parts to this titration. Uh, at the very beginning here, before we start the titration, once again, the only thing that we have in the beaker is a weak base, which means it's just a KB type problem. Uh, so you, again, you can use the concentration of the weak base. You don't have to worry about uh, using moles or anything like that because we haven't added anything. And it's just a normal sort of uh, weak base type table. When we uh, start the titration to before the equivalence point, uh, much like the previous one we talked about there, uh, you will basically hit a buffer at this point. And again, uh, you'll need really uh, one ice table. And again, just like the previous one, the purpose really of that table is to figure out the concentration of your buffer components. And then again, you have the same two options there as we talked about previously. You could either go into the henderson hasselbalch equation or again, you could do a secondary ice table instead of the henderson hasselbalch equation. Remember though, that because this is a weak base, you probably will have the KB perhaps given to you. Uh, so if you do go into the henderson hasselbalch equation, you gotta make sure that you are going in uh, with the PKA sort of value and not the PKB value as you do that. You will end up with the difference here between really the top titration and the bottom titration is pretty much you're going to end up with more of a basic type buffer as opposed to an acidic type buffer that you have on the top uh, titration curve is going to happen here. At the equivalence point, once again, uh, we're going to hit a salt and it will go also through hydrolysis as well, again, because it comes from a weak base. And because it does come from a weak base, when that salt goes through hydrolysis, it's going to act as this conjugate acid or an acid. And that means that the salt's actually gonna donate the H plus over to water. The result of that is it's going to create H3O plus, uh, which means we should expect this equivalence point to be acidic at this point. And you'll need really the same kind of two tables at that point of the equivalence point. You'll need one table to figure out the concentration of your salt. Uh, then you will need, obviously, the second table as a hydrolysis type table. Lastly, here, uh, we're going to go uh, past that equivalence point. And that is essentially kind of the same idea. You're just going to keep adding acid basically to your titration. And you're just going to have an excess amount of acid at that point as you pass the equivalence point. So you need one ice table. Purpose of that ice table is to figure out the concentration of the strong acid that you have left over. At that point, you could go right into the pH equation and get the pH at that point. Obviously, all these ice tables that you need to do uh, when we are adding volume should be done in moles, as we talked about. And then you should switch it back to molarity using the total volume at the end of that first ice table. Uh, that's really good practice. As I might have mentioned last time, the good news is on all these here, uh, you have done these calculations before in other parts earlier on in the chapter. The key is what most people struggle with is to know what you're doing, where you're at, and what type of calculation you should be doing. So uh, again, kind of knowing where you're at is very, very helpful. Any questions on any of that there? Okay, then uh, let's do uh, that problem that everybody did at home. All right, I, I won't ask as though. All right, so we're gonna do this titration uh, problem here. And by the way, we have a problem like this where we're doing a titration and there's multiple parts in this titration curve to calculate. Um, we do sort of think of each part as being uh, a separate sort of question in a sense. Uh, we don't continue volumes typically. So like part A, we didn't do anything. Part B, we opened it up all the way to 80 and then shut it. Uh, for part D, we started at zero, opened it up all the way to 105. So we don't typically sort of add volume to part A, to part B, to part C uh, when we do these type of problems, unless it specifically says to do so in the problem. So in this case, we are doing a titration of 100 milliliters of 0.1 molar nitrous acid.
Uh, it's going to be titrated with 0.1 molar uh, sodium hydroxide. We do have a Ka for nitrous acid. So off the bat here, since we see a Ka for this guy, we do know this is a weak acid. Uh, this is a strong base. So that is, again, the type of titration that we are doing here. That also should give you sort of visualization of what's going on uh, in the titration curve. So we're going to start with A here. Why not? Uh, and that is the initial solution. So that is what is the pH uh, before we really add any sodium hydroxide. So we'll start with that. So A here, uh, we're going to take our uh, 0.1 molar uh, nitrous acid. And again, uh, before we start the titration, uh, that's basically the only thing that we have present. We have a Ka value here of uh, 4.5 to the minus 4 or something like that. Okay. So because of that, that is a weak acid. So really to calculate the pH here, we're just going to do a basic sort of Ka type of problem here, which would require an ice table. Once again, we have not added anything, so we're good to go with the molarity here. So we could just put it in here. This is going to be a normal ice table with some zeros and Xs. That means at equilibrium here, we will have 0 0.1 minus X, X, and X. This will go into our Ka expression here of our products. over our reactants that obviously equals our ka value there so putting those guys in we get x squared divided by 0 0.1 minus x equals 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, we could assume that x is equal to 0 which i'm sure you did at home and while you're at home you're disappointed to find out that it is a bad assumption with like a 6.7 percent so if you do the assumption here and you check it, which you should, you will actually get uh, a bad assumption there, which I'm sure that's what happened. And now at this point, that means we do need to go back here and solve it uh, another way. So we're going to use our quadratic. So we're going to multiply everything on the bottom to the other side. And if we do that there, we will get uh, x squared is equal to 0 0.000045 minus 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4x. We're going to bring everybody to the same side. So x squared plus uh, 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4x. And that's going to be a minus 0 0.000045 is equal to 0. That's going to give us our uh, ABC. We're going to go into our quadratic here. So our X is going to equal um, negative B. So it's going to be minus uh, 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4 plus or minus. If you do a little bit of the square root there and you clean up the inside of the square root, uh, I'm thinking it is 0 0.00018023. If you do a little square root action, uh, 0 0.0134. That's all going to be divided by 2 times A, which is 1 in this case here. That's going to give us, as normal, right, our two uh, X values in this case. So if we do the uh, positive here and do the addition, uh, we end up with an X value of 0 0.006475. Or if we do the subtraction, uh, we end up with an X value of minus 0 0.00. I think it's like 6525 here. Clearly, since we are looking for the pH, which means we are looking for the H plus in this case, uh, that negative is not going to work very well for us. So we will go with this guy, which would uh, then equal the H plus concentration. So going into our pH is negative log of 0 0.006475. And if we do that there, we're going to open up with a 2.19 pH to start our titration. 
it does make sense as it's an acid in there and that's definitely an acidic uh, sort of pH. Any questions on those things? Again, a good reminder make sure you do check your assumption. And again, we're going with the 5% rule. Uh, so if it's bigger than that, then obviously you need to solve it a different way. Any questions on that step there? So we're starting our titration curve here. Uh, we've got a pH of like 2.9. So, you know, we're like down here. All right. We're going to then actually start our titration here. And we want to figure out what is the uh, pH after we add uh, 80 milliliters of our acid, our base. So let's do that one there. So that's going to be, uh, we have 100 milliliters of 0 0.1 molar nitrous acid, and we want to know the pH after we add 80 milliliters of 0 0.1 molar uh, sodium hydroxide. Again, still working with the same Ka, uh, 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4 in this case. All right, so clearly here we are going to have a reaction since we are adding uh, some sodium hydroxide. So we know we need to do hopefully an ice table. We also know we should do it in moles, so we might want to get the moles of everybody here. So our moles of nitrous acid would be convert our volume into liters, move the decimal or divide by a thousand, get it times it by the molarity, which is 0.1 moles per liter. Liters cancel, it's going to give us 0.1 times 0.1, it's going to give us a 0 0.01 mole of nitrous acid. We'll do the same thing for our sodium hydroxide in this case, and we will convert the volume into liters. So that's 0 0.08 liters, also times in it by the molarity of the base, which is 0 0.1 moles per liter, where our liters again are going to cancel. Going to give us here 0 0.008 moles of sodium hydroxide. So clearly we need the reaction between our nitrous acid and sodium hydroxide. And that is going to get us there some water and a little uh, sodium nitrate here, I think. In this case, nitrite. Here we go. Sodium nitrate. And uh, now we can do our ice table. And again, here we're obviously doing it in moles, as we talked about. So we will mole it up here. So initially here, we do have uh, 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.01 moles. Uh, sodium hydroxide, 0 0.008 moles. And we have zero, this guy. Uh, we are starting with this guy here in the beaker. Uh, we are adding this guy. So am I uh, before, am I at, or am I after the equivalence point? I am before the equivalence point. The moles of what I'm adding is less than what I'm starting with. So really right off the bat, I should know this should be what type of problem? It should be, we'll see in a second. All right, we'll see. <laughs> All right, so we will know the change here will be the sodium hydroxide, which will be minus 0 0.008, minus 0 0.008, and a plus 0 0.008. All right, so we're going to end up with here uh, 0 0.01 minus 0 0.008. 0 0.0020 0 and 0 0.008 moles. Remember, now that we've done the first table, really just good, good back to molarity. Uh, the, our total volume at this point is we started with 100. Uh, we added 80 milliliters. So we're going to have a total volume at this point in the titration of 180 milliliters. Uh, so we're going to divide these guys by 0.18 liters to convert it back into molarity. Obviously, again, obviously converting our milliliters into liters so that we do get molarity here. 
And that will get us here 0 0.0111 and 0 0.008 divided by 0 0.180. That's going to give us 0 0.0444. Now, if you're not sure what type of problem it is and what you have to do now, we could always use our ice table to figure out we have this guy left over. We have this guy left over. Are these guys related to each other? They are a what? They are a buffer, which is what we should have known right before we even started. Once we figured out that it is before the equivalence point in this type of titration, and we did get a buffer like we expect it to happen here. Any questions on the table here? So as I talked about before, you do have two options. You can, again, either use the henderson hausbach which is probably the best option, I would think, or you can do a second ice table. I'm going to do the henderson hausbach uh, which means I do need my pKa. It's going to be negative log 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4. And that's going to get me here uh, 335. So my pH will equal my pKa plus the log of the base over the acid. So we're going to do a 3.35 plus the log once again, our base is going to be this guy, usually obviously uh, has like a spectator ion, has one less hydrogen. And by the way, the other one is nitrous acid. So that seems like that should be the acid, right? So that is 0 0.0444 divided by our acid, 0 0.111. That's going to get us there. Butter. Uh, 395 here on our pH. Any questions on that one there? So obviously this is before the equivalence point. And as we can see, we are increasing the pH, which makes sense because we're adding base. So we are at least, you know, sort of moving in the right direction, kind of raising the pH a little bit there. The next part of this question is what is going to be the pH here when we reach the equivalence point? So we're looking at now kind of jumping up to the equivalence point and kind of seeing where it's going to be. So let's take a look at that here. And that is, uh, I guess that's C, huh? At the equivalence point, so we are still have our 100 milliliters of our 0 0.1 molar nitrous acid. Uh, we are still adding 0 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide, and we still have a Ka here of 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4. All right, so clearly uh, we are going to have our reaction that's going to take place is going to be the same one, HNO2 plus our sodium hydroxide goes to H2O and our sodium nitrite here. We also know we should do some moles, so we're going to have really the uh, same moles of our HNO2 that we had previously. Uh, so we'll do that same calculation here. And that's going to give us our same starting moles of uh, 0 0.01. Now I am clearly at the equivalence point at this point, right? I do need the moles of sodium hydroxide, so I should know the moles of sodium hydroxide should be should be equal. So I kind of know the number, right? Because they have to be equal. And that's good because they didn't really give us a volume, but we will need the volume to reach the equivalence point, right? So we can figure out the total volume that's happening. The volume in this case to reach the equivalence point can be found a couple of ways. We could do a little, I'll do it up here, a little M1V1 equals M2V2 because this is a one-to-one -one relationship. So it's all good. So we could do 100 times 0.1 divided by uh, 0.1, which gives us V2 will be 100 milliliters needed to reach the equivalence point. By the way, we now know the moles for sure that we need, and we already knew the molarity. 
which means we could also do a little molarity is equal to moles per liter. Liters is equal to moles divided by molarity, which means we could have took our moles and we could have took the molarity of our sodium hydroxide and divide it. Bless you. And again, if you did that, uh, you will get 0 0.1 liters, which if you multiply by 1,000 is 100 milliliters. So that's another way, again, you could kind of just use the molarity and the moles that you need to know to figure out the volume. And by the way, if they are the same molarity and it is a one-to-one, -one, you need an equal volume to get to the equivalence point. It's basically a quick way to do it as well. Any questions on any of the ways to figure out how much volume to reach the equivalence point? All right, so now that we know that, which we'll need a little bit later, we could continue our ice table here. Um, by the way, we are at the equivalence point, which means in this type of titration, what type of problem should we hit? We should hit a salt that will go through hydrolysis. So let's see if we do, right? So change here is going to be minus 0 0.01, minus 0 0.01, and a plus uh, 0 0.01. That means that we will end up with not a nothing, uh, 0 0.01 moles here. Now that we know our volume to reach the equivalence point was 100, and we started with 100, so don't forget about the other 100, our total volume in this case is actually going to be 200 milliliters, right? 100 plus 100, 200 milliliters. We will convert this guy into molarity, which you definitely probably need at this point. That's an explanation point on my calculator. Uh, so we'll do that. That's going to give us a uh, 0 0.05 molar. At this point, what we have left over is this guy, which, as you correctly said and we expected, we have a salt left over. And this salt, as we should expect, will go through hydrolysis because it comes from a weak acid. And when it goes through hydrolysis, it will act as a base to do that. So this is the part of the titration curve where we need a second ice table. And that's going to be an NO2 minus, which is the part that will go through hydrolysis, plus some water. And again, in this case, it's going to act as a base, which means it will accept our H plus and it will make where it came from and it will make hydroxide. Also, what we should expect is the pH at the equivalence point should be basic, right? By the way, we also need what type of K when we do the calculations? We do need a KB. We don't have a KB, we have a KA, right? So again, these are things you wanna think about as you're rolling through this. Our initial, our equilibrium concentration of our salt will become our initial concentration over here. And the rest of this table are just zeros and x's. So we're going to do some zeros. We're going to do a minus x, uh, plus x, plus x. Going to be 0 0.05 minus x, x and x. I'm going to get rid of what's on the bottom there. So I've got a little place to write, I think. Okay, so as we just talked about a second ago, right, uh, we do have hydroxide there on the product side which is the big key of you should be probably be using a KB value. Remember, if you have H3O plus or H plus on the product side, then it should be a KA type situation. So this would be a KB, and that would be our products over our reactants. By the way, we should probably calculate that KB. So our KB here would be 1 times 10 to the minus 14, which is KW, divided by our KA of 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4. That's going to get us here. A uh, looks like 2.2 .2 times 10 to the minus 11. So uh, putting in our values here, going to give us x squared uh, divided by 0 0.05 minus x equals 2.2 .2 times 10 to the minus 11. I'm going to assume x is equal to 0. 
that will give me x squared uh, divided by 0 0.05 equals 2.2 .2 times 10 to the minus 11. I'm going to multiply the bottom to the other side and do a little square root action as well. So 0 0.05 and a square root. Going to give me a x value here of uh, 1.054. Four times 10 to the minus six. I do want to check it by dividing by 0 0.05 and times it by 100. And we're not even like 0.1%. So uh, the check here is good. So that will equal, also important to remember, it actually equals our hydroxide concentration, right? So uh, that's going to equal the hydroxide concentration. So that's going to be a POH, which I'll just go right there. POH is going to equal minus the log of uh, 1.054 times 10 to the minus 6. So uh, minus the log, 1.054 to the minus 6. It's going to give us a 598. Now, this is also really important that you understand that where you are at the equivalence point, we do expect it to be basic, right? So if by some chance you're doing your calculation, you end up with this number and you think that is the pH, it should not make sense to you, right? Because that would then be obviously an acidic pH. So again, uh, we do need to subtract our 14 here. So we'll do a 14 minus 5.98. And that's going to give us the basic pH that we're looking for of a classic 8.02 at this point. Any questions on any part of that there? Again, our pH is going up, right? And it shot up pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, within 20 milliliters, you know, it shot up from like a pH of three all the way up to like a pH of eight, right? So it jumped pretty high. And that's what we do expect as we kind of head into uh, the equivalence point. Any questions on anything? <clears throat> All right, last part here as we're completing it is our indicator probably changed color, but that didn't stop you. So we're going to continue on this way. Uh, and uh, we're at 105 milliliters of the base being added in this case. So uh, part D here, uh, what is the pH from our 100 milliliters of 0 0.1 molar nitrous acid? after we add 105 milliliters of 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. Still has the same KH. All right, so clearly we're still titrating and uh, we are going to get our moles here of everybody. So our HNO2 is gonna still be our same moles. And again, uh, 0 0.1 times 0 0.1. Going to do our uh, sodium hydroxide here, 0 0.105 liters times 0 0.1. Liters will cancel. And that's going to give us 0 0.105 times uh, 0 0.1. 0 0.0105 moles of our sodium hydroxide. So once again, looking at our ice table here, uh, we got our reaction that we've been dealing with. So initially here, uh, we got 0 0.01 moles. We got 0 0.0105 moles and we have zero. And once again, uh, this is what we're starting with. Uh, this is what we're adding. And obviously, if we didn't have the benefit of the previous question, or part of the question, we should know that we are past the equivalence point at this point, because the moles of what we are adding is more than the moles of what we started with. So we're definitely after the equivalence point. And uh, because we're after the equivalence point, we have that switch is going to occur where, in this case, it is our base that's going to be the excess reagent, and it's going to be our acid that's going to be the limiting. So the change here should be the acid. 
I mean, is at equilibrium. We have none of the acid left over, which is what we would expect to happen because at this point in this type of titration, we should expect some excess amount of uh, base happening in this case, right? Our total volume is going to be 100 uh, plus 105. So that's a 205 milliliter total volume. We could convert these guys back into molarity by dividing by the 205. And if we do that there, and maybe punch the right number in would be good as well, 0 0.002439. And 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.205, uh, 0 0.04878. So here I got this guy left over. I got this guy left over. Is this a buffer henderson hosbach situation? It is not, right? So again, because you have two numbers, don't put it into the equation. So here, as we should expect by knowing that we are past the equivalence point, this is the point in the titration where we're just dumping in base, right? So although the salt will go through hydrolysis, as we talked about, pretty much by dumping in that strong base, that's going to be definitely the major contributor here to the hydroxide in that solution. Remember, the salt's got to go find some water and do a little bit of reaction. So we're going to ignore the contribution of the salt at this point. And that means that essentially we have basically a strong base that's left over here. And that because that's a strong base, that's going to be our hydroxide concentration. And that means that we can go into our pOH at this point. Minus the log of the OH minus. Minus the log of 0 0.002439. Minus the uh, log that. That's a 2.61. Once again, we're going to take the 14 minus that. And we're going to get our pH at this point, which we should expect to be fairly basic. And I would say 11.39 would definitely be fairly basic at this point. And it again does make sense because in this point of the titration, frankly, you're just dumping hydroxide in there, right? So the amount of hydroxide should jump really high and we should get a pretty good uh, jump there in our pH. Also, again, we see another kind of big jump in the pH, right? Only adding five milliliters in this big titration here, going from a equivalence point of eight all the way up here to almost 12-ish or 11.4. And that's within five milliliters, a pretty big jump in pH as well. Any questions on any of those? Yeah. Why is everything a one-way Why is everything a one-way reaction? Uh, because uh, technically speaking, uh, this part is just the reaction between the acid and the base. Um, the second ice table, for example, if you need to do a second ice table or that, would be more of an equilibrium because uh, we're kind of creating these things, so we're just dumping them together. Uh, so at the end, it will create both of these things. Uh, you can't have the arrows going in both cases, but um, on the second ice table is typically where you have those arrows kind of going in both ways. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> And the idea there is on the first one is sort of going to sort of completion and a sense of where you're going to stop at that point. And then you'll have stuff in the solution that can set up an equilibrium. And then you would have the arrows going in both directions. Other questions? All right. Questions on titration. You should be titration experts. Yes. All right. Uh, did we talk about uh, indicators last time? I forget. We did. No? Okay. All right, so the last thing we're going to talk about, did I just say last thing in Chapter 14? I can't believe it. All right, so last thing here in Chapter 14 is we're going to talk about acid-base indicators a little bit more. We've sort of been talking about it, I think, as we've kind of been going through. But as I mentioned before, acid-base indicators, most of them are kind of like weak acids, and that's what really this shows. There's kind of a protonated form of the indicator, and that's what the IN stands for is indicator here. And the H is like an acid, has an H plus to give or accept. And a sort of deprotonated form of the indicator in solution. And if the ratio of sort of the protonated form uh, to the uh, deprotonated form is greater than or equal to 10, then really the color of the acid uh, will be seen in the uh, solution. And if it's opposite, if it's less than that, then you'll see more of the base. Now, as we talked about, pretty much all acid-base indicators work over a specific pH range. Uh, 
And obviously they go, most of them go from kind of one color to another color. And the idea, obviously, when you go to choose an indicator, not all indicators are the same. So it does depend on what type of titrations you're doing. Um, so if you think about the titrations, you know, we've been doing or I've been talking about, you know, there's certain uh, equivalence point pHs that we sort of expect, right? In certain cases, we might expect it to be neutral. In other cases, we might expect the pH at the equivalence point to be basic or to be acidic. So you would obviously want to choose an indicator that would change color near your equivalence point, because when you do a titration, that's usually where you want to stop your titration, right? Is at the equivalence point, and you want some type of visual representation of, hey, you should probably shut the burette off now because it just changed colors, like our friend phenyl failing, right, which is colorless and then goes to a pink color, and you want to kind of stop titrating right there at that kind of lightest pink color that you get. Uh, you can see here some of these other ones, you know, if we look at like crystal violet, goes from multicolors, kind of yellow, green, blue type color as it's going over. Uh, you have some of these that are more of a red to orange color, and there's a lot of different indicators. And you can see they do work over a specific pH range, you know. Uh, so, for example, if you took something like crystal violet, would that be a, a good indicator to use in a titration where the equivalence point would be basic? It would not because, frankly, it was working over like a zero to like two-ish range in terms of pH, which means after two, it's going to be blue, right, all the way through, all right? And that almost rhymes, I think. So it's going to be blue all the way through there um, after you hit two. So you're not going to have really the change of color to tell you to stop. You're going to stop way too early, obviously, in that case, right? So you would want to pick something more in the basic range. Um, and again, you do want to make sure that you kind of choose one where you actually kind of see the color were perhaps change. So, you know, you would want something perhaps, you know, that the equivalence point might be in that range or that range if you're going to choose that. So you can kind of see some type of distinction. Same thing here. You know, this guy will start more reddish and then it'll end up more of a yellowish type color. So there's our phenol failing down there in our eight to 10 range. And again, as we talked about, uh, around 8.3 or so, it really is still colorless. And again, gets a kind of a lighter shade of pink as you go this way. And as we talked about, that's why uh, people always yell at you to try to do it when you're using phenolphthalein, again, to a, a very light color pink, because that puts you kind of back in this range, which is probably near where your equivalent point is going to be. Um, so why don't we try this one here? Why don't you take a second? What indicators from this list uh, would be maybe good ones to use in this type of titration. So take a moment and choose which ones you think might be good here. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, so probably the first thing you want to figure out is what type of titration you're dealing with. So HNO2, as we just saw, is what type of acid? It's a weak acid, right? KOH is a strong base. So you're doing uh, this titration, right, of a uh, weak acid with a strong base, right? Equivalence point in that type of titration should be acidic, basic, neutral. Should be basic, right? Because we're going to hit a salt that will go through hydrolysis at the equivalence point. And because it comes from a weak acid, it's going to act as a base, right? And it's going to accept the H plus from the water, as we saw in that example we did. And that means that if we look here, thymol blue works over 1.2 to 2.8. That's going to be a little too early, right? That's going to also be a little too early for us to see it. Probably too early, too early, too early. This guy here is probably too early as well, because by 7.6, it's probably already changed color, right? So it's going to be sitting at blue still probably, so you're not going to be able to kind of see it there. So really, your uh, maybe two options on this list would be our final two options here, right? Might be good choices, uh, which is the creosol red, uh, which definitely gets us into the basic, and our phenol failing, which also obviously gets us into the basic. Now, if you were going to do a titration and you had a choice of indicators, you could calculate the theoretical pH, right, of your titration at the equivalence point. And you can pick one that is maybe more suited than the other and really sort of dial in your selection of an indicator. By the way, if you did like a diprotic 
acid, right? Look like that. It'll have two equivalence points. Okay. You might want to choose some different indicators, right? One for the first one and one for the second one, right? So sometimes, you know, in a diprotic acid, your titration curve will look something like that with two equivalent points that are basically happening as well. So one might be basic, one might be acidic, actually, in a situation like that. Any questions on how to choose the correct indicator? All right. So definitely here, creosol red or phenolphthalein for our champagne here. The end of chapter 14, I can't believe it. We just call it a class at this point, go to home. <laughs> All right. That is the end of chapter 14, sadly. All right, so it is off to chapter 15. The good news is, uh, you know, we're on the top of the roller coaster here. All this left is downhill, hopefully, in a good way, I hope. <laughs> so uh, this is the last chapter that, uh, again, usually gives people a pretty difficult time. And it's not a long chapter, but there's a lot of sort of things going on in this chapter in terms of um, making sure you understand what is happening. So we're going to talk about a couple other uh, K-type values here. That's KSP. Uh, and KSP stands for the solubility product. And our friend uh, KF, uh, which is the formation constant. So these things are used for uh, really two different things. Uh, KSP is all about things that are insoluble. So a little solubility rules, perhaps. And KF is all about complex ions, which we'll talk about a little bit in this chapter, and we'll hit again in a later chapter as well. So these two things... Uh, are kind of opposite on the spectrum of uh, even their values are extremely opposites. These are almost like the extremes of K values. And what I mean by that, as we will see, is uh, KSPs are typically very, very small, and KF values are typically very, very large. So they're kind of like on opposite sides of what's going on here. So we're going to start with the KSP and the solubility equilibrium. So if we think about our solubility rules like Chlorides, bromides, iodides are soluble in everything except for lead, mercury, and silver. Uh, if we have silver chloride, it will be something that is insoluble. Now, just because solubility rules tell you that it's going to be insoluble, even something that is technically insoluble and will make a solid, uh, will still, believe it or not, break apart a little bit. So a little bit of it will still break apart in solution. And because of that, it's able to set up an equilibrium. So like all those things where you look at solubility rules and they say this thing is insoluble, um, doesn't mean you only have a solid. Actually in solution, there's a smidge of it is going to break apart into their ions. And we could write a, an equation for this. And this is typically how KSP sort of reactions are written. You typically have solid guys on the reactant side, and they typically go to aqueous ions on the product side. So it's usually solid on the reactant side, aqueous ions on the product side. And because it can set up an equilibrium like silver chloride here, we could actually write an equilibrium expression, which is the same type of equilibrium expression we've done before, which is our products over our reactant. Except typically here in the KSP, since the reactant side is always solid, it's pretty much just products. So we just do products in this case. And that would be the concentration of silver times the concentration of chloride would equal the KSP value. And that, again, is known as the solubility product. Now, we still do everything like we normally do when we write an equilibrium expression because a KSP is no different than any other equilibrium expression. This has a little different subscript. Um, we still use the coefficients as the exponents. So something like magnesium fluoride will break apart into one magnesium and two fluorides. So again, here we do need to take into account the coefficient when we write the equilibrium expression. Uh, same thing here, silver carbonate, two and a one. So we got the square, the silver. And something like calcium phosphate, a three and a two which means we need to cube it and square it here when we write these expressions. 
So you could think of KSP as sort of the equilibrium constant for things that are typically found to be insoluble. As we'll talk about in this chapter, even things that are insoluble, our solubility rules say this, you should always get a solid when you throw these two things together. There are certain situations that can affect whether or not you will actually see the solid form. Uh, things like concentration, pH, and common ions, and these type of things all play a role as to whether or not you will actually kind of see that solid form. So sometimes we're taught in like the previous class, like these are always going to happen no matter what. You throw these two guys together in any situation, you're going to get a solid that's going to form. And that's really not the case. Uh, the environment plays a big role as to whether or not you might see the solid or not see the solid actually form. So we can also use uh, something to help us decide whether or not a precipitate will form and that's our friend Q. And Q is also the same Q that we saw previously. That's the reaction quotient. If you remember, we used Q in a situation where we weren't sure if we were at equilibrium or not. And you calculate it the exact same way as you calculate K, uh, which means, for example, if I wanted to calculate Q for this, it would be the concentration of silver times the concentration of chloride. Or if I wanted to calculate Q for this guy, Q would be the concentration of magnesium and the concentration of fluoride squared in this case. So you could do a very similar thing that we did with the original Q that we did, which is you could calculate Q and you could compare it to the KSP value, and it will tell you whether or not you would expect a precipitate to form. So if you calculate Q and it is less than the KSP value, you have an unsaturated solution. And as you might know, an unsaturated solution it's a solution where you haven't hit the saturation point. That means you could take more solid and dissolve it pretty much until you hit a saturated solution. So you would not expect the precipitate to form. So again, if you put Q on the left and K on the right here, opposite of where it points, it is pointing towards the product side. And always in these reactions, the product side is aqueous. So you would not expect the precipitate to form. If you calculate Q and it equals the KSP, you have hit a saturated solution. And a saturated solution is one where pretty much you've hit the maximum amount of solid, right? That will dissolve at a given temperature, right? That's all based on temperature solubility. So the maximum amount that will dissolve at that. And really you're at that point pretty much if you do anything more to it, you're gonna get a precipitate, but technically it's sort of in that transition point of, most people will probably consider it going towards you would get a precipitate if you're exactly at that point, but you're pretty much technically at the point where everything should dissolve. And if you put any more in there, even like one low crystal, it won't dissolve. So you're kind of at that tipping point. If you calculate Q and it's greater than the KSP, then it goes opposite of where it's pointing, which is to the reactant side. And you would expect a precipitate to form. You have a super saturated solution. And a reminder, a supersaturated solution is a solution that has way too much solute dissolved in the solvent. And typically it's unstable and that solid wants to come out of solution because of that. You like got too much of it dissolved in there and you would expect a precipitate to form. So we could use Q to help us decide whether or not a precipitate will form or not. Uh, again, a lot of this is based on solubility. So you want to review your solubility rules, you can, but the good news is there's a lot of workarounds between that. If you uh, don't really necessarily need to know extremely a lot about solubility, you should know um, at least those basic rules. It would probably be very helpful, but there is ways around it. Here's some table from your book of some KSP values, which you should not memorize at all. But uh, what we do see as we kind of scroll around here, the screen, uh, there's a lot of super small KSP values. Yeah? And KSP values in general are very, very small. And the reason that they're very small is these are things that are typically found to be insoluble. And if we think about our equation, which is pretty much our solid goes to our aqueous ions, where this is basically insoluble over here, and this is soluble over here, if I have a small K value, when I reach equilibrium, do I mainly have reactants or products? If I have a small K value, I should mainly have reactants, yeah. So that means that you mainly have these guys, which is the solid, and they're insoluble. 
So that's why we think about these things as being insoluble because for the most part with these really small values of KSP, you pretty much have reactants, which means you pretty much have the solid guy still together. Even though you still may have a majority of the solid guys still together, there will still be that equilibrium being set up and a little bit of it will break apart into ions, but the majority of it will stay together. And that's what we typically see with KSP values as you roll through this table, you see very, very small values of it. And again, that's going to cause you to have mainly the solid being there. So when we talk about solubility, especially with KSP, uh, we oftentimes want to calculate the solubility of things. And there's really kind of two types of solubility that we oftentimes will calculate. And that is the molar solubility, uh, which I guess is a fancy way of saying molarity. So that is the moles per liter. You're essentially calculating the molarity of everybody that's in there. And we sometimes just talk about what is the solubility of something in a more usable type unit, like how many grams can you dissolve in a liter? So grams per liter, for example, it's sometimes just the solubility of it. And it's again, just tells you how many grams you can do that. There's really two types of KSP problems that you come across for the most part. One really does require an ice table to be used. Uh, the other one, you don't necessarily have to use an ice table to do these type of problems, but it might also be very helpful in this situation to do an ice table. So one sort of problem that's very common is they want you to actually calculate what is the KSP of a particular compound. So in that case, you're not given the KSP, but you actually want to calculate the KSP. So you want to start out with the solubility of the compound. And again, that could be in any type of units, like grams per liter, milligrams per liter, whatever it may be. You want to eventually get that to the molarity of the compound. And then you want to relate the molarity to the individual ions and get the concentration of the ions that are in that solution. And then you could go into the KSP expression and actually solve for what the KSP is. So this route, you really technically don't necessarily need to do an ice table, but it can be very helpful here. And I'll explain why in just a second. Uh, the other type of problem is, frankly, you're just given like a formula, like silver chloride, and you're maybe just given the KSP value, and that's all you're given. And they want you to actually calculate what the solubility of, say, silver chloride is in water or something like that. In that situation, that is usually for sure an ice table situation coming down the bottom here uh, where we do an ice table. Uh, we solve for it kind of like what we do with the X and we will get the molar solubility from the actual ice table. And then you could calculate something else if you want a gram per liter or something like that. By the way, if I did have the molar solubility in moles per liter, and I want to go to just the solubility in grams per liter, what is the thing that allows me to go from one to the other? It is the molar mass, right? Which is grams per mole, which is the thing that will allow you to go back and forth between those two. If you have the moles per liter, you can multiply it by the molar mass, right? And I'll give you grams per liter. If you have grams per liter and want the molar solubility, you would divide by the molar mass and that will get you to the molarity. So the molar mass from the periodic table is the one that kind of lets you go kind of back and forth in terms of the solubility. All right, let's take a look at this one here together and uh, I'll kind of show you uh, what's going on. The solubility of silver phosphate with a dramatic pause there between those things. I'm not sure why, but we'll put it back together here a little bit better. Uh, at 25 degrees, it's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per liter. We're looking for what is the KSP of silver phosphate. So a couple of things we want to think about here is clearly, by the way, and this is where you could sort of get around the, uh, I'm not really sure about solubility rules, or I don't remember them, or my teacher never made me learn them, any of those questions, is if you see something like a KSP, uh, you pretty much know it's going to be insoluble. So mostly pretty much everybody that has a KSP is insoluble. So there's your solubility rules without having to worry about them. So we know that this guy is going to be insoluble because we're looking for its KSP, which means we know this guy is going to be a solid. But even though it is a solid, it will break apart into three silver ions and a phosphate. 
and we can write a KSP expression for this, which in this case would be the concentration of silver. And we do need to cube it because of the coefficient that's there times the concentration of phosphate. And that equals our KSP, which is actually what we're looking for in this particular case. So I'm gonna show you how to do it with an ice table, which is probably a good idea. And I'll explain how you could sort of shortcut the ice table if you didn't want to do it in this particular case. So we're going to do an ice table here. And when we do an ice table with uh, KSP type problems, we do it a little bit different, but it's very much the same as what we've done previously. So initially here, we're not gonna even obviously be concerned with our reactant side because it's solid. So it doesn't go into the expression. So we don't have to worry about it. We are going to go with uh, zeros here because we're not given anything, for example, even though we are, we're gonna pretend we're not. And in this particular case, we are going to do our minuses and our pluses. And since we're not doing anything on the reactant side, uh, that would still be our minuses. Our pluses would still be on the product side. We actually typically do use a different letter here when we're doing uh, KSP. And we actually use S instead of X. And S stands for the molar solubility or the molarity, basically. If you want to still use X, you can, but a lot of times people will use S to stand for the molar solubility here. We still need to take the coefficient into account. So this would be plus 3S and this would be plus S. That means that when we reach equilibrium, we basically have 3S and S. Any questions on the ice table here? And this is typically how you would do an ice table in a uh, KSP type problem that if you needed to do an ice table or wanted to do an ice table, this is sort of how you would set it up. Now, normally what we would do right at this point is if these were X's and it doesn't really matter if it's X or S's, we would put this into our KSP expression. So we would go into our KSP expression and go 3S in cubed times S would equal our KSP. In this case, we don't really have the KSP given to us, right? So that's what we're trying to solve. Now, we know that S stands for the molar solubility. And what they gave us right here is S. That is the molar solubility, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per liter. So that means that all I have to do at this point is put in here three times 1.6 times 10 to the minus five. I still need to cube it. And I get to times it by 1.6 times 10 to the minus five. And that will give me A KSP in this case of 1.8 times 10 to the minus 18, which is a relatively small value and probably pretty good in this case. First off, any questions on that? Now, you may be also saying that is the molar solubility of the whole thing, right? But it all works out the same. So typically when you solve for S, uh, that is basically the molar solubility of the whole thing. That's also perhaps in some cases, the solubility of the ions uh, along the way, um, but uh, it will all work out the same. Why would I say that it is, say maybe do the ice table in this type of problem uh, rather than, by the way, if you understood how concentration works, uh, basically you know that if you have this guy like we did up there and we might've talked about it, on the way. Well, I know the concentration of this guy is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 5 molar. It is a 1, 2, 3 relationship. So I take my 3 times 1 times 10 to the minus 5. And it is a 1 to 1 relationship, which means I take 1 times 1 times 6 times 10 to the minus 5. And now I could have both of these concentrations and I could just stick it into this expression. And you don't necessarily have to do dice table. And that is how you could get to those uh, calculations. The reason I say it's probably a good idea to even to do the ice table is it is a very common mistake that people do this and they go, well, 
I multiplied it by three. Do I still need a qubit? Or I cubed it. Do I need to multiply it by three? And very commonly, when people uh, sometimes will just do this move, uh, they'll forget like to multiply it by three. Uh, they might forget to cube it. So sometimes the ice table, you can kind of see, oh, I got to go three times S, so I should do the three. So it is helpful to do that. But if you understand the concentration of an ionic compound to the concentration of its ions, you can really just figure out the concentration of the ions and plug it into the KSP expression, uh, which is sort of like doing the ice table, but sometimes just seeing that, oh, yeah, I do need to uh, multiply this by three, so I'm going to do that. I also still need a qubit as well, so you don't miss any of those type of things. Any questions on that? By the way, what that, uh, if I wanted the concentration, though, of silver at equilibrium in this solution, it would be the number you get when you times this by three, right? And for phosphate, it would be this guy, right? And I think that's because we do have three silvers, right, to one phosphate. So it's three times as concentrated in terms of silver as it is phosphate. Any questions on that one there? All right, so why don't you try one here? What is the solubility in grams per liter of uh, silver chloride, KSP of silver chloride, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10. And uh, what is that? Silver is 107.9, I think. And chlorine is uh, 35.45, I think. I'll give you a hint. You need a nice table on this one. Okay, let's take a look here. So this is a situation where, uh, again, uh, maybe you're not given any information really other than the KSP, or you might have really have to look up the KSP in a table. This is definitely an ice table situation. Uh, once again, we do see the KSPs. So again, if you didn't know your solubility rules, you should know silver chloride should be a solid in this case. Uh, so we will write our silver chloride breaking apart there into some silver ions and some chloride ions here. Our uh, KSP expression here going to be our silver times our chloride, and that will equal our 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10. We're going to do an ice table here. So again, going to be zeros for our beginning. Our change here will be plus S and plus S. That means at equilibrium, uh, we'll have S and S. Any questions on that so far? Like normal, now that we actually do have a KSP value in this case, we're going to uh, throw our equilibrium line into our expression. That's going to give us S times S is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10. That's a little S squared action there. We're going to do a little square root of the other side there. And um, can I put the number in would help probably minus 10. There we go. It's going to give us an S of point, uh, zero, 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 one, two, six. That would be our solubility in this case of chloride. And that would be the concentration, by the way since that S represents the molar solubility, that would be the concentration of chloride ions that are floating around in solution. That would also, in this case, be the concentration of the silver ions that are floating around in this case as well. And since it is a one-to-one -one rela rela uh, relationship going backwards, or even from the chloride, it's a one-to-one -one relationship, that is also the molar solubility of silver chloride as well, since it's all related to each other in that sort of relationship. Now, that basically means I have 0 0.0000126 moles per liter of silver chloride. As we talked about, we want it actually in grams per liter, so we can use our molar mass of silver chloride from the periodic table. We're just going to add those together there, and that's going to get us like a buck uh, 43 point, uh, we'll call it four grams per mole. We'll use that to convert us into grams per liter. Moles will cancel and we will end up with about uh, 0 0.0018 
one grams per liter. And that would be technically the molar solubility here of silver chloride in water. Is that a lot? That number basically means that you could take 0 0.00, we'll call it two, 0 0.002 grams, and that's how much silver chloride you could get to dissolve in 1,000 milliliters of water. Is that a lot? It's a very, very small amount, right? And that's why when we think about silver chloride, we think about it as being insoluble because pretty much you could get a super small amount to actually break apart and be soluble. Uh, it's going to be very, very insoluble in this case. That's a very small amount that you can actually get to dissolve. Any questions on that? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, we're going to lay it up there for today, I think.